This is a continuation of Who Was Albert Einstein? This is the second part. When a person invents something, for example, a battery-powered back scratcher for miniature poodles, the inventor sends a description of the invention to a patent office. An examiner looks at the idea and decides if it's really something new or just something that's a little bit different from an already invented gadget. If it's really a new idea, the inventor gets a patent, which means other people aren't allowed to copy it. It takes a very smart person to understand inventions when they are just at the idea stage. Albert was that person. Reading applications for new inventions was like solving puzzles. Albert was so good at his job that each day he completed his work long before it was time to go home. He was then able to turn his attentions to his first love, thinking. Imagine what that must have been like for Albert. It would be like a kid going to school every morning, finishing all the schoolwork within an hour, and then playing for the rest of the day. With all that time to think, Albert ended up writing and publishing more scientific papers. In one year alone, he published five groundbreaking papers in a very famous German journal about physics. A storm broke loose in my mind, explained Albert. So in some ways his patent office turned out to be his patent office job turned out to be a lot better than the teaching job that he had originally hoped for. With steady work at the patent office, Albert felt that he could ask Milvia to marry him. So he did. She said yes and they were married in 1903. The following year their son Hans Albert was born. Now Albert had the time to enjoy music, long dinners, long walks with his family. Albert was happy and secure. Confident in his job, he could relax, be more of himself. For Albert, that meant dressing carelessly, wearing the same wrinkled shirt day after day, and often forgetting to brush his hair. As someone once said, Einstein looked as if he just smoked an exploding cigar. Albert's years at the patent office were wonderful. He had, a family, he had family time to think and write lots of scientific papers and enough money. Many of the greatest scientific achievements of the 20th century electronics, the atom bomb, space travel, were all suggested by Einstein in the papers he published while he worked at the patent office. Those ideas were then worked on further by scientists in other in the decades that followed. Then in 1909, the University of Zurich convinced Albert to leave the patent office and become a professor. Albert would actually be paid to teach and study physics. Life was even more wonderful. In a short time, Albert became a very popular professor. College students enjoyed the way he explained difficult concepts with simple images. Think about this image, a man falling freely in the Earth's gravitational field who drops an object will not notice it is falling. And Albert loved to lecture. It is the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge. Albert was invented, invited to speak all over Europe. He was a rising star Albert accepted other teaching jobs that took him only, not only to Zurich, but to other European cities like Bern, Prague, and Munich. Albert's theories were startling. For example, Albert claimed that light bent as it traveled through space. This surprised scientists who assumed that light was always traveled in a straight line. Who was right? Often the scientific theory couldn't be proven. proven. But this theory could be. During a total solar eclipse, the moon blocks the sun's bright light from the viewers on Earth. This makes it possible to photograph the light of the stars beyond the sun. Albert insisted that a study of those photos would show light bending as it passed other planets and the sun. All Albert needed to do was wait for about four years for the next total eclipse in 1914. Many scientists who were also excited to see whether Albert's light theory was correct in 
1911, plans be were begun to send a group of scientists to Russia to test Albert's theory. Russia was one of the best locations from which to photograph the stars during the eclipse. Of course, 1914 was still far in the future. In the meantime, Albert continued to think, give lectures, and develop his eccentric genius style. Hopelessly absent-minded, he often forgot his apartment key, even on his wedding night, lost luggage, forgot to eat, and used money as a bookmark, then lost the book. He always buttoned just the top button of his waistcoat. Why? It's, similar that, it's simpler that way, he said. When Albert shaved, he used only water, which is a very painful way to shave. So a friend gave him a shaving cream. Albert tried it and said it was marvelous, and then he went back to using just water. Why was that? It's simpler that way, he replied. Questioned about his odd look, he explained, it would be a sad situation if the wrapper were better than the meat wrapped inside it. What was really amazing was how Albert was becoming popular with people who had no interest in science. With his wild hair, mismatched socks, wrinkled shirts, and pants that were too short, Albert was not just a brilliant physicist anymore, physics professor. He was a personality. His mysterious smile beamed from the front pages of newspapers around the world, a genius who had unlocked the secrets of God's own mind. People who didn't understand a bit of his physics, who didn't know an isobar from an ice cream bar, were fascinated by Albert Einstein. Articles about Albert showed up in many magazines and newspapers. Had TV already been invented, Albert would have been the subject of all kinds of hour-long specials. In 1913, a famous university offered to pay Albert more money than he had ever made before. All he had to do was come to the school and think. He would teach only when he felt like it. It was a dream come true, almost. The one drawback was that the university was in Berlin, Germany. Although it had been nearly 20 years since Albert lived in Germany, he hadn't forgotten his awful high school years and Albert's wife, Milvia, didn't like Berlin or the people there. She thought they were mean and unfriendly. Milvia was also jealous of Albert's success. She was a brilliant scientist, but the world only cared about Albert. The more she thought about it, the less she wanted to live in Zur leave Zurich and their many friends. Albert had to make a decision. Would he go off to Berlin to think or stay in Zurich and be a good husband and father. Albert needed brilliant people around him who could help him think about his ideas. By the time a at the time, a scientist said, only a dozen men in the world understand relativity and eight of them live in Berlin. Albert remembered his hikes through Italy and the promises he made to himself. He decided to go to Berlin. Albert left Milvia and their two children behind in Switzerland. Albert once admitted, I treat my wife as an employee whom one cannot fire. It was not surprising that Milvia and Albert soon got divorced. Thereafter, Albert had little to do with her or their two sons. Years later, when Albert won the Nobel Prize in 1922, he sent the prize money to Milvia and their sons. Perhaps this made him feel less guilty for having abandoned his family. Albert's oldest son, Hans Albert, grew up to become a distinguished science professor in California. Occasionally, he visited his father, Edward, his father, Edward, born in 1910, the younger son, whom Albert nicknamed Teddle, which means little bear, was gifted in music and literature, but suffered from mental illness. After his mother's death, Edward Eddard lived in a hospital for the rest of his life. Albert once congratulated his son, Hans Albert, whose birthday he never remembered for being just like himself when it came to family. It is a joy for me to have a son who has inherited the main trait of my personality, 
the ability to rise above mere existence by sacrificing oneself through the years for an impersonal goal. This is the best, indeed the only way in which we can make ourselves independent from personal fate and from other human beings. Albert never questioned his decision to choose scientific discovery over family. As for moving to Berlin, Milvia had good reason for not wanting to live in Germany. In the early 1900s, the countries of Europe were struggling with each other for power. Some countries had a lot of land, but less money. Many people were not allowed to worship as they wished. Several countries had large populations, but weak armies. They all wanted what the others had, and they were all willing to fight for it. The tensions grew and grew. There was so much hatred. Europe felt like it was going to burst. Germany was one of the scariest countries. The government wanted to build the most powerful army in Europe to get rid of all the German all of Germany's enemies. When Albert arrived in 1914, Berlin was full of German soldiers that were trained, armed, and eager for war. It was a very uncomfortable place for a peace-loving Albert to live. But one person in Berlin, Albert's cousin, Elsa, made life much more pleasant. Elsa was full of affection for Albert. They started to spend a lot of time together. Elsa was soon in love with Albert, the man, not the scientist. As far as Albert was concerned, he and Elsa were a much happier match than Albert and the challenging Milvia. Soon the couple announced that they were there that they were going to get married. Elsa took care of Albert, which was a which was good because Albert certainly didn't. He was ever more careless about getting enough sleep and eating properly. Albert's doctor said of him, as his mind knows no limits, so his body follows no set rules. He sleeps until he is wakened. He stays awake until he is told to go to bed. He will go hungry until he is given something to eat and then he eats until he is stopped. Elsa looked after him, making sure Albert got up on time, got dressed, and ate his breakfast. Life with his second wife suited Albert very well. However, it is an interesting fact that Albert's very scientific thinking was done during his marriage to Milia. His very best scientific thinking. Perhaps that doesn't mean anything. Or perhaps, as some critics say, his great theories might really be their great theories, or even her great theories. Some publications, even Time Magazine, which proclaimed Albert Einstein Person of the Century in its December 31st, 1999 issue, wondered exactly what Milvia may have contributed to her husband's scientific ideas. In 1914, Europe finally burst. The weak political arguments that had kept countries out of war collapsed. World War I erupted with Germany's great armies facing France, Russia, and England, and quickly winning many battles. Wars run on hate, drain countries of food and money, and cause deaths of many. Albert hated the war. He hated all wars. This war was brought a particular frustration to Albert. He had hoped to prove his theory of curving light through photos of the 1914 eclipse, just as German scientists were setting up cameras in Russia, war broke out. Germany and Russia were now enemies. The Russians arrested the German scientists and destroyed their equipment. The eclipse passed with no photos. It would be another five years before Albert would have a chance to photograph another total eclipse. The combined forces of Russia, France, and England eventually slowed and stopped the German victories. The war became a stalemate. Year after year, neither side could, drain, could gain clear victory over the other. The supplies needed to fight the long war drained Germany of its money, food, and fuel. And meanwhile, thousands of German soldiers died each day. German leaders kept insisting that the war would end in their favor. They ordered the country's best scientists to say that. Yes, indeed, Germany was doing a great job fighting the war. Albert refused to make such statements. He said, 
Never do anything against conscience, even if the state demands it, and he meant it. The German government was furious with Albert. It wanted to put Albert and his ridiculous head of hair into jail, but Albert was lucky. He was still a citizen of Switzerland. It was difficult for the Germans to imprison somebody from another country, especially a peaceful one like Switzerland. Germany finally lost the war in 1918. Albert had managed to stay out of jail. More, more than ever, Albert was committed to promoting peace. In the following year, 1919, there was going to be a full eclipse, the first since the one in 1914 that didn't get photographed. It was a step, step up or shut up time for Albert and his theory of bending light. Many scientists in Germany hoped that Albert would be proven wrong. Then perhaps all his other theories would be ignored too. Before the eclipse, cameras were set up to, in two locations, one in South America and one on an island on the coast of the West Africa. There were two cameras in case clouds suddenly moved in and blocked the eclipse in one place. That, that way there was still a chance to get photos at the other location. The cameras were pointed at the sun. Ordinarily, an intense sunlight made it impossible to see or photograph the movement of light as it passed the sun and planets. But then the moon moved in between the sun and the earth it blocked the sun's brightness and suddenly light not seen before could be photographed. The cameras clicked. Once the photos graphs were, take, were developed, Albert was sure they would show that light bent as it passed the sun and other planets. On November 7, 1919, the news was announced Albert was right. Light did bend. Although very few people understood what Albert Einstein was talking about, the whole world recognized that he was a genius. Suddenly, Albert was a superstar. A tobacco company even introduced a new product, the Einstein Cigar. And within a year of the eclipse, over 100 books and articles about Albert were published. Now, 80 years later, the number of books and articles about Albert is in the thousands. Um, this book was written uh, about eight years ago, so it's almost 90 years now since then. All the fuss may sound wonderful, but to Albert it meant losing his treasured privacy. The attention Albert wrote to a friend was so bad that I could hardly breathe, let alone get down to any sensible work. He was the first genius superstar. Albert made the best of an uncomfortable situation. Because of his growing fame, he could have become rich by appearing on radio shows, making speeches, and writing books. A London theater offered Albert as much money as he wanted if Albert would appear on stage with fire eaters and tightrope walkers. Albert's act would be explaining his theories, but Albert said no. Instead of making money, he wanted to use his influence to make the world a better place. For Albert, that meant world, a world without war. Albert Einstein said, unless the cause of peace based on law gathers behind, it is the force and zeal of a religion. It, har and it hardly can hope to succeed. Albert's fame brought him thousands of letters from people all over the world, not just scientists either. Kids, newspaper reporters, political leaders, college students, they all wrote to him. Many of the letters came from Jewish people right in Germany. They were kept out of schools, denied jobs, and not allowed to vote. Albert was Jewish. Couldn't he do anything? For, the long, for a long time, Albert wanted to help create a homeland for Jewish people. The current Jewish nation of Israel did not exist in the 1900s. The land where Israel is now was called Palestine. Like many other Jews, Albert thought that this area was where the Jewish homeland belonged. In 1921, Albert traveled with other important Jewish people to the United States. He wanted to raise money for a Jewish homeland in Palestine. 
Albert enjoyed the long boat trip from Europe to America. He looked out at the endless ocean and felt dissolved and immense in nature. It reminded Albert how tiny one man was compared to the greatness of nature. He was not so important as the world was making him out to be. That thought, he said, makes me happy. So Albert was quiet, quite surprised to see thousands of people, including reporters and photographers, waiting at the pier when the ship arrived in New York City. Wherever he went, where there were huge crowds eager to see the genius who unlocked secrets of the universe. The mayor of New York was personally welcomed him and presented Albert with a key to the city. There was a parade in his honor. When Albert visited Washington, D.C., President Warren Harding invited him to the White House. Albert's eccentric, generous look was a big hit with Americans. With his wild hair, messy clothes, and friendly personality, Albert charmed reporters. He often asked, could you briefly explain your theory of relativity? This question drove Albert nuts. After all, it had taken him 15 years of intense thinking to develop the theory, but he'd take a deep breath and smile and say, when a man sits with a pretty girl for an hour, it seems like a minute, but let him sit on a hot stove for a minute and it's longer than any hour. It's relativity. Although Albert was a superstar in the United States, he was unwanted, an unwanted problem in Germany. Although he still had his teaching job in Berlin, it became harder for Albert to stay in Germany with each passing year. After the Nazis took control of Germany in 1930, Albert's life was increasingly in danger. Nazi hated, Nazis hated Jews, intellectuals, and pacifists. Albert was all three. When Nazis emptied university libraries of their books and burned them, it was often Albert's books that topped the huge bonfire. By 1930, Albert had done most of his best scientific thinking. His focus now was on the politics and public speaking. This made the Nazis even angrier. For the, his safety, Elsa pleaded with Albert to stop speaking out against the Nazis. He refused. He said, I wouldn't be Einstein if I kept quiet. He also refused to leave Germany, even though more and more friends and family begged him to. The Einsteins did, however, take many trips to more welcoming countries. They traveled to the Middle East, to Asia, to the west coast of the United States. Everywhere they went, they were greeted by large cheering crowds. Japan even declared the day of Albert's arrival there a national holiday. In Spain, he was greeted by the king and thousands of fans. Albert received honorary degrees from Oxford, Cambridge, and the Sorbonne, Harvard, and many other universities around the world. He was a great professor, a guest professor, raised funds for Jewish causes, and warned of the growing political hatred in Germany. How strange for Albert to be adored all over the world except in the country where he had been born. The Nazis published a book called 100 Authors Against Einstein. All Albert said was, why 100? If I were wrong, one would have been enough. Albert was very lucky to have survived in Nazi Germany. In 1931, while Albert and was a guest professor in California, Adolf Hitler declared Albert a spy. Hitler put out a death warrant for Albert. In 1933, while Albert and Elsa were returning home from their trip to California, Nazis broke into the Einstein summer house in Germany a bread knife was found in the kitchen, a perfectly natural place for a bread knife to be, but the Nazis used the knife as proof of what dangerous man Albert was. The Nazis seized everything Albert owned, his home and his money. Now there was no question about moving. Albert and Elsa rented a house in Belgium where Albert's stepdaughters also came to live. But in Belgium, a book from Germany was now available. It included photographs of Nazi enemies. Albert's photo was on the very first page. 
with the words not yet hanged printed next to it. Belgium was not a safe place to stay either. But where would the Einsteins go? England? No, Elsa was afraid to live there. In England, the Nazis had offered a huge reward for Albert's murder. Albert joked, I never knew I was worth so much. In the end, Albert and Elsa decided that the United States would be their new home. Albert became a professor of mathematics at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, New Jersey. Albert asked for a salary of 3000 Elsa got that up to 16000 By the end of 1933, he and Elsa had settled into a small college town. The early years in Princeton were very difficult. Albert was 54 years old. He was not a young man. He was no longer startling the world with new ideas. Then just three years after their move to Princeton, Elsa passed away. Albert was lonely and heartbroken. His own health suffered. He had barely left Elsa's side for the last 12 months of her life. Albert also kept hearing about friends who had been murdered in Germany. With all of the energy that he had left, he was determined to do whatever he could to stop the Nazis. He played the violin at fundraising concerts, but that was not going to put an end to Hitler. Albert's famous equation, M equals MC squared, said that if just a few atoms were converged to, converted to energy, the amount of energy produced would be massive. In 1939, Albert learned that European scientists were at work trying to make an atomic bomb. Albert feared what the Germans would do if they were the first to build such a bomb. So Albert wrote a letter to President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt. He asked that the United States begin developing an atomic bomb right away. This could not have been an easy letter for a man like Albert to write. He hated war. He hated weapons, yet now he was asking the United States to hurry up and build the most destructive bomb ever imagined. Even the simplest atom bomb could destroy an entire city and kill thousands of people within seconds. But Albert thought that it would be worse if the Nazis were the ones with the, such a weapon. Partly because of Albert's letter, President Roosevelt had secret work begun on building an atomic bomb. Albert later reflected on his this moment in world history. I made one great mistake in my life when I signed the letter to President Roosevelt recommending that the atom, bomb, atom bombs be made, but there was some justification, the danger that the Germans would make them. After World War II, Albert spent time and energy trying to limit the development of the at atomic weapons. I do not know how the Third World war will be fought, he warned, but I do know how the fourth will with sticks and stones. What he meant was that after a third world war with atomic bombs, the modern world would be destroyed and humans would have to go back to living like cavemen. We scientists, Albert said, must consider it our solemn duty to do all in our power in preventing these weapons from being used even today, some people blame Einstein for the atom bomb because he discovered the relationship between mass and energy. But can anybody blame Isaac Newton, who was the first explained the laws of gravity for every plane that crashes to the ground? In 1940, at age 61, Albert became a citizen of the United States. For the rest of his life, he remained in Princeton, New Jersey, and worked on something called the unified field theory. But surprisingly, Albert never, pin it, fin it. Albert never produced a finished theory. In many ways, Albert's life had come full circle. Toward the end of his life, he wrote, I am generally regarded as sort of a petrified object, rendered deaf and blind by the years. He loved to take walks just as he always had, and although Albert never drove a car, he loved to sail. He would take out a one-engine boat, aimed at it at other boats, and then at the last moment, swerve aside. In Princeton, he was a familiar sight. 
walking back and forth between his home and office, often chatting with neighbors. He spoke English with an accent. I think I will study a little study. She is a very good theory. His shaggy hair, now white, grew even wilder, and he often went outside, went without socks, belt, or suspenders. Once some boys asked Albert why he never wore socks. With a sly smile, he answered that he was now old enough that if he didn't want to, he didn't have to. On his walks, Albert was enough to stop and help, was known to stop and help and fix a child's bicycle. And when a young girl came to his house asking for help with her math homework, Albert not only did just that, but shared his lunch of a can of baked beans with her. As for his own children, Albert rarely saw his sons. Hans Albert had fled Nazi Germany and later moved to California. Eddard and Milvia remained safe in Switzerland where Milvia died in 1948. Albert's sister and best friend, Maja, came to live with him in Princeton. As a child, Albert had a horrible temper that once led him to hit Maja in the head. In these later years, she smiled to and say, she would smile and say, to be the sister of a thinker, you must have a very thick skull. Life in Princeton was pleasant. In the evenings, just as Albert and his mother used to play duets, he played violin with other musicians. He ended up spending the last 20 years of his life at the house. At his house at 112, 112 Mercer Street in Princeton. He loved the old house, its gardens, and the way the light came through the windows. When they first moved to Mercer Street, Elsa had pictured when had a picture window put in Albert's study. From there, Albert could enjoy the beauty and mystery of nature as he always had, watching birds fly, flowers bloom, and the morning sunshine. Everything is determined, the beginning as well as the end, by forces over which we have no control. It is determined for the insect as well as for the star, human beings, vegetables, or cosmic dust. We all dance to a mysterious tune, entombed in the distance by an invisible player. That's what Albert Einstein wrote. By 1948, Albert was in poor health. His heart was getting weaker and weaker. A doctor missed, insisted that Albert take a certain medicine. Albert hesitated. The doctor insisted. So Albert took the medicine and immediately got sick to his stomach. There, he snapped to the doctor, do you feel better now? Yet there was a reason for happiness during the years. In 1948, the Jewish nation of Israel was created. Albert was overjoyed. All of his work had helped to bring about something wonderful. After Israel's first president died, Albert was asked to become the next president. Albert said no. Politics is for the moment, he wrote once, while an equation is for eternity. Still, he was greatly honored by the offer. In 1950, Albert made his will. He wanted all his science papers left to the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. In 1951, Maja died. Now Albert had neither his wife nor sister. He was more alone than ever. He surrounded himself with family photos. He said, a photograph never grows old. You and I change, people change, all through the months and years, but a photograph always remains the same. How nice to look at a photograph of a mother or father taken many years ago. You see them as you remember them. That is why I think a photograph can be kind. Several years later, after a brief illness, Albert was admitted to the Princeton Hospital. On April 17, 1955, he asked that his eyeglasses, some paper, and a pen be brought to his hospital bed. He had work, thinking to do. The next day, he died with a sheet of equations next to him. To the very end, Albert was thinking. The last letter he wrote was one that urged all nations to give up nuclear weapons. 
The Einstein House at 112 Mercer Street in Princeton, New Jersey is treated no differently than any other home in the neighborhood. That's the way Albert wanted it. He worried that if it was turned into a museum, people would concern themselves too much with his memory and not enough with their own future. After Albert's death, the scientific community mourned the loss of a great and original mind. Jews mourned the loss of a leader who always wished for a better, more peaceful world. Even in the darkness moments, darkest moments of Jewish history, and all the people mourned the loss of a unique, peace-loving man. Perhaps Albert said it best, only a life lived for others is a life worthwhile. Albert was not the best husband. He was not the best father. But as a friend said of Albert, he was the freest man I have ever known. Albert left these instructions upon his death. Donate my brain to science, cremate my body, and throw the ashes in some secret place. This was done. So where is Albert's brain now? After Albert died, an autopsy was done on his body. In the process, the doctor, Thomas Hen Harvey, removed Albert's brain, studied it, decided that there was nothing all that special about it, and set it aside in a bottle of formaldehyde. Later, when Dr. Harvey moved to Wichita, Kansas, he took the brain with him. He kept the brain, which was in pieces, in two jars inside a cardboard box labeled cider. Since then, further studies by several medical researchers have found Albert's brain to be a bit more interesting than Dr. Harvey did. Dr. Hardy, Harvey provided the researchers with pieces of the brain. Albert's brain weighed less than the average brain, was 15% wider, and had an unusual set of grooves. Yet the importance of these differences remains unknown. Harvey kept the brain with him for over 40 years. Wow, that's a long time. One time, Harvey and Michael Paternini, an author, put the brain in the trunk of the car and drove it all the way to California so that a piece of it could be given to Albert's granddaughter, Evelyn. Soon after that trip, Harvey turned the brain over to the Princeton Hospital where it continues to float around in a jar. You have to wonder what Albert would think of that. I don't think he would have liked that, do you? There's Albert Einstein. He was born in 1879 and he died in 1955. That was an interesting book. I didn't know that much about Albert Einstein, so it was interesting to learn about it. There's some... Um, parts that I didn't read because they didn't have to do with the story. They're more what he's thinking. So maybe I'll make another video with just those parts. Okay, hope you enjoyed that book. Love you.